Are we live? I believe we might be live. Coming to you for take number three. <laughs> Please let us be live. Please on, let bro. this be live. Please let this be live. Yo, we now have to act like this is the first time we're talking to each other, even though we've had three runs into this intro. That's all good. We call that the warm up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Back before the come up. I mean, I think we'll be all right. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. We're fighting through technical difficulties, but nonetheless, it doesn't stop any of the excitement whatsoever that we have coming to this show, to our favorite spot, to do our favorite thing, which is reach out to Live Nation. What up, people? What it do? Uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming here. I needed this. this week, man. I needed it. Bad. Hit me, bad, real. But uh, I've been, I've had a, it's been a mixed bag. You know what I mean? It's been a mixed bag. And my car got towed, but also we did fun day. You know what I mean? Lost the homie DMX, but also we're here talking to the people, man. It's been a mixed bag, G. It's been a mixed bag. So hold yeah. on, man, one time. DMX. We lost uh, a young black man who gave us a lot. Gave yeah. Us a lot. Yeah, yeah. 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 RPX, man. Um, it's sad. It's sad. Uh, hip hop loses another legend. Uh, you know, at times like this, you see a lot of people run to try and validate the the accolades that that said person had before they left. They try to rank their greatness. Uh, that we got to do none of that, you know. I think we can we can just appreciate a person for who he was to us, for who he was as a hip hop artist, and for who he was as a vulnerable black man trying to find himself, you know. Um, regardless of how you feel about it, he gave what he gave helped a lot of people and was felt by a lot of people. And so, off of that alone, man, um, you know, rest in peace, X. A lot of people, a lot, man. When I heard, when I first heard that he was in the hospital with a heart attack, you know what I mean? And, and the first thing I thought was, man, X gonna pull through, for sure, for sure. Mm. And the second thing I thought was, oh, this video that seems like it never stopped circulating the internet. You know what I'm saying? This X on stage, overalls, you know what I'm saying? And an ocean, a for real, a sea of people man, going absolutely crazy, absolutely yeah. nothing, man. You know what I mean? When you talk about somebody who moved people, man, X is an incredible example of that. So rest up, X, and shout out to all his fans, man. Anybody who might be listening, you know, we lift up his name, we lift up all y'all, for real. For sure, for sure. You know, Miles Mal Xavier, um, we gonna get into the show uh, very quickly. And I want to run to the intro because I have a very, you know, off of that X conversation, it seems to me, it seems to be that black, black men die young. It does seem to me that black men die young. There's a lot of things that, that remind us of that all the time. 50 is extremely young. We're, we're hanging around with 50 olds right now. You know, it's like, it's not that old. Yeah, man, it's crazy. And it just reminds you that every day is a gift. Every day is a blessing, you know what I mean? And, and nothing is promised. So don't wait to, to tell nobody how you feel about them. Don't wait to make that move that you need to make to, to get to where you need to get to. You yes, know what sir. I'm saying? Don't wait to show love and, and, and be yourself. I saw, I saw a quote the other day that, that really struck me. It's like, uh, you are being held back because you're afraid to look stupid. And I was like, yeah, true. True, you know what I'm saying? There are a lot of spaces that my professional career has brought me into where I, I'm trying to uh, be on 10 at all times, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I just needed that reminder of like, sometimes don't hold back what you have to say, what you have to contribute, what might feel half-baked compared to where it's going. Give it out because that fear of looking stupid will hold you back, so. Shout out to whoever need to hear that. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And even deeper than that, it's like looking stupid is always the first step into learning something and becoming good at it. Like there is that wall of 
damn, I'll look dumb. And honestly, like, I, like, there's a lot of things that I feel about that, about myself that I try to confront, but I do understand a lot of times that if something, if I'm afraid of looking stupid and that's deterring me from attempting something, that's usually something I should attempt just for the reason that that's the reaction that I have to it. And it's just like, you know, because I feel like it's going to make me look stupid, this is how I know I should do it. I mean, even this podcast for us, we're not particularly um, people that are very active on social media. We are very, you know, we're very private people. But nonetheless, it's like, damn, man, will I look stupid if I'm out here just talking on this microphone all the time? So I, but like, that's, and we spoke about that. We like, dude, because this is so far out of our comfort zone, this is how we know we should be doing this show. Yeah, man, that's what leads to growth. I feel definitely that I've grown both in my ability to just communicate and, uh, and even just to like the ease and the comfort of like talking on like Zoom, right? So it's no surprise to nobody that we have to do this over over a, over a video service, right? Like that. And that's a lot. That's what a lot of business is conducted over. So this space has made me right at home, mighty comfy in a lot of conversations where, you know, before not being on Zoom as much might have thrown me up. And just speaking in general, speaking with camera on, thinking about the weight of your words is definitely just a uh, you know, it's 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 eased that. We'll see how that translates as we get back to more public speaking, being for real public speaking. But I'm appreciative of this space for the opportunity to grow. I'm appreciative of you for being willing to to wade into those waters that that scare us and allow that to be the compass into what we should be doing. Uh, and I just encourage everybody out there to seize the day. You know what I mean? Don't wait. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and how we and how we seize the day for y'all is by bringing you some carefully curated content for your cranium every week here at the All the Way Live podcast. Me and Miles Xavier put together a bespoken show for your audio pleasure. Mm-hmm. We're trying to heal your head top, you know what I mean? <laughs> We are trying to heal your head top for sure, for sure. And how we have broken that down is into three distinct parts of the show. Those three parts start with stumble upon. Now, in stumble upon, these are the different thoughts, things, and tribulations that me and Miles Xavier have gone through over the week. Anything that is particularly interesting that has sparked our interest, we look at that. We break it down. And we bring it to the people. And this week, apparently Netflix is losing 31% of its market share this year alone. What's going on? Hey, man. Hey, man. That's, I think that's something to get into, man. I don't know. I don't know if I'm the only one that's feeling like it's been a little bit of mid coming out the Netflix factory. The Netflix scroll, don't really, I ain't really finding too much that catch my eye like I used to. And I did that make Disney Plus, Hulu, Amazon look mighty good for to a lot of people. So we'll get into what's going on, man. But they going down. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And then from there, we take it straight into current news. Now, on current news, this is where me and Miles Xavier reach for the... Yeah, man. The tip top. The tip top of what is burning hot in current news. And this week, that is 25 of major companies in the U.S. apparently are not paying taxes. Surprise, surprise, people. Zero, nada. When I say nada, sometimes that even means additional in a negativo, which means they're getting paid by taxes. This don't make no sense. Don't make no sense. Negative taxes. Double negative. Double negative is a positive, and we're going to dive deep into that, man. We're going to dive deep into that, breaking that down, and you know, in current news, we apply our time, we apply our brains, we apply our research into these topics, so we're bringing you shit, bringing you I, I gotta, you see, that's the thing though, man. Like, I still, like, I'll, I'll swear by accident and then I, like, remember my mom's listening. You know what I'm saying? So, I've been sorry. trying to hold, trying to keep them in the tuck till at least, like, the 35 minute mark. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Listen. But that's a lot. <laughs> what you just said, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff to give them, man. That's a lot of stuff, bro. I don't know if they can handle it. That is a lot. That is a lot. But it doesn't stop there because from there we go into recommended and review. And over here at recommended and review, this is our absolute favorite part of the show. Miles Xavier, please tell the people why this is our favorite part of the show. 
I love recommending and review. So we get to hear from you. You know what I'm saying? We watch what you recommend. We recommend what y'all should probably watch. Check out. I love it. It's a beautiful ecosystem. Back and forth. Ecological harmony of film and music and MMA. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, on today's episode, what we have to talk about is far from a beautiful, a beautiful thing. In fact, I call it a disgusting conversation we're having this week, which is reviewing Ellen versus Pharaoh, the Woody Allen documentary. Uh, I'm tired of these old men touching little kids. It's disgusting, but we watched it. We watched it for y'all. Not the old men touching kids, but the documentary about the old man touching kids. It was nasty. Nasty, gross, disgusting. But it's important, I think, to like just recognize that there are lots of examples of celebrity pulling the wool over people's eyes. There are lots of there's a lot to, to say about misogyny and how a lot of times powerful men are allowed to do get away with some craziness right before our very eyes. And being silent about it clearly doesn't help nobody, as we will see. But we'll get to that, man. We'll get to that. We'll get to that, man. We'll get to that. But if we're speaking about, if we're entering into the show, Miles Xavier, can I please very much get a gunshot for the Mandulo Foundation team for the work that they did this week at the Live Orphanage Lanceria. Yes, thank sir. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Gunshots and Air Horns, our foundation was able to put together an absolutely lovely day for the children. I loved it, I love it. This was Mandula Foundation's fun day, no? Hey man, listen. It it is. It was. It had to be our fun day because it, it's. It was our absolute pleasure being able to do this. We've been working um, with the team, uh, supporting them where they can be. We have superstars. Our, you know, we always say that like the backbone of this entire organization is built on strong black women, and so we want to be able to thank uh, Paloma. We want to thank Nomonde for all the work that they did putting this fun day together. Man, oh man. What a lovely day, man. All these kids, dude, I was holding kids. They were crying on my shoulder. It was beautiful. Chilla cried. It was a whole thing. Wow, man. It sounds super powerful. It sounds like something that I seriously, seriously, seriously missed out. And to be there. I don't know. We're going to have to work out how the foundation going to have to fly a brother once this COVID stuff clears. I'm one half of the way to my vaccination. For y'all out there, anybody that cares, and I feel fine, feel good. So, so yeah. whatever that, whatever that. Uh, but man, I wish I could have been there. You sent me some amazing, incredible pictures. But like, kids were having all sorts of fun, being served hot dogs, participating in different activities. I, uh, I'm extremely jealous. I felt like a kid pressed up against the glass. Like, man, love <laughs> <laughs> there. Anything else you want to add about that that amazing experience? Yeah, I mean, particularly, you know, it. For and if and if we're having a moment of transparency, um, you know, for our foundation, we have been working tirelessly over the last couple of weeks, couple of months, putting together um, what would have been the biggest deal that we had closed at this point in time. You know, this is this was a very big, um, you know, we were chasing a very big opportunity, an opportunity that very much could have changed the entire trajectory of the company. We were very hard and we we're very close to it with a with a well-known brand and um at the last minute you know the the deal did not materialize at least in the time that we wanted it to and so going from that that happened we got that we got the email the night before and we spoke with each other and then the, that next day we we're at this orphanage and the crazy thing is that abs like all of all of the people that were at the orphanage kept on coming up to us and saying we they were saying you know your guys's company is going to do great things and we wishing you guys the best of luck and all of that type of stuff and so for us it just became a reassurance that regardless of uh the response we might have gotten from one from knocking on one particular door um clearly there's a lot of uh good energy that's pushing us to be able to get back up you know recalibrate ourselves dust ourselves off and dive back into closing something big again, again. I think the way that uh, you see 
the opportunity and obstacles and 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 uh, characterize those challenges is boss talk, man. That's boss talk. You know, we 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 look toward the future. I think uh, I, it is not lost on me how much work went into that proposal and the quality of that work stands right. So I'm happy with what we've done and and I'm excited about where we'll be able to take it next um, and what type of collaboration uh, will will result when somebody sees sees the vision for for what it is. So uh, the only pushback I have is on talking about that that project in any sense in the past tense. Uh, yeah. And I want to highlight you as as in your leadership and taking over uh, taking over this project, the fun day, and just uh, coordinating across continents in a way that is that is that is very that is very inspiring. Man is catching multiple multiple uh, phone calls from many different time zones throughout the day, and, and it's impressive. Heavy is the head, but the crown gleaming. We see you. We see you. Hey, man, listen. Wait. You. <laughs> but you know, you know more than you know more than I that it, it is indeed a completely a team thing, you know. And if we're gonna extend the conversation past just particularly the business that we're doing and the work that we're doing. Um, and have a conversation about what it actually takes to be able to build an organization that does things, it, it is underlined by the members of that team. And so I can say for us particularly, um, being very strategic about creating a very strong core of people that can deliver on work, you know, bringing young experts, um, making them owners as well. Like, you know, we, we brought... Chicago's finest, you know, we took Chicago, it's, it's that type of thing, you know, and um, for that's, let me say in the journey that I'm facing and that we're facing and, and growing in this professional, um, growing in this professional aspect of building companies and building organizations, the value of team is insurmountable. I think that is the key maker or breaker of of an organization success is a team. Big facts. Big major gigantic facts. And if you are listening to this, you are part, you know what I'm saying? You are an integral, important part of the work we're doing. This space definitely uh restores me to be able to do the work I do on a daily basis. So I appreciate being in conversation with my brother and sharing that conversation with y'all out there. That warmed me up, man. I think we needed that after the DMX talk, man. I think we needed yeah. that. That's a that's a beautiful thing you'll be able to do, man. I don't know if there's a link to any type of uh, pictures or anything like that that we can drop in the description, but I think we should be we got to be better about sharing what's going on and, and, and all the exciting things that uh, mine's moving, mine's making moves. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And we'll get better at that, you know, over time. Um, it's, it's, everything is a process. You, you build things slowly. Even with this podcast over here, you know, if you look at the first videos, they, the quality wasn't as cool. You know, your boys weren't gleaming the way they're gleaming now. The, you know, the microphones weren't where they are. But we're building it slowly and surely, man. And if, if anybody that's been rocking with us to this point, we hope you see the growth. And you hope you see some of the structure that we've put into place because the structure of Miles Xavier is what the people are here for. They are here for the content. Man, boy, do we got it. Lead, lead us in, brother. What you saying? Listen, man. So the beautiful thing about, you know, being on the cutting edge is that sometimes conversations come back around. So I think it was a couple months ago that we were discussing uh, the the entrance of Disney Plus into the streaming movie game, uh, the the hold that Netflix has kind of had in that market, and uh, you know some of the other major competitors, Hulu, Amazon, where they stood, and uh, I don't really, you know, I don't remember the specifics of that conversation, but uh, a recent development is that Netflix has lost 31% of its market share over the last year. Um, 30, 31%, that's a lot. 31% is a lot. That's is there right. numbers to that? Uh, yeah, so I think they went from 29% uh, of the market to 20% of the market. 
right? So they now stand at 20%, the largest of the major companies. Amazon is at 16% of the market. Hulu is 13%. HBO Max is 12 Disney is 11%, and all others, including Stars, Paramount Plus, uh, Shutter, which is a horror movie streaming service, which is actually really dope. All of the others make up 28%. So all those small ones make up a collective bigger than any of the major ones. But among the major companies, Netflix is number one for now at 20%. Interesting. Interesting. But that's what happens once you, that's what happens when more companies come into the market that naturally the market share gets, um, you lose, you lose market share. But then, you know, outside of that, we, we had a conversation about the quality of the work that Netflix was doing and the lack of options that they were rolling in and how that impact, the impact that that's had on the user. So it could be a combination of both things with just Netflix not delivering it enough uh, compelling content and then on the other side you have these different guys stars coming in with um uh with power <laughs> i know people bought subscriptions for power for sure word word i think netflix certainly had like a uh like a heyday right like a period where boom stranger things boom ozark boom orange is the new black you know what i'm saying and it, there was just these shows that people were really tapped in and and I think Netflix was, uh, they were putting a lot of money into new original content and it was hitting, but mm. that's kind of waned over, over the years. And we see there are a lot of potential reasons for that, right? A lot of those shows were dropped, boom, all at once, very bingeable. You run through the whole season, right? Which I think is the right way to watch a lot of shows, especially some where the storyline might be a little, eh, not waiting week to week is, a, I think, is a way to get people through a lot more of those shows, get a lot more eyes on it. But on the other hand, right, you look at the statistics, Disney is set to overtake Netflix, right? So, like, this year, Disney Plus is set to overtake Netflix. This, this year? year? No, no, my fault. Disney is projected to take overtake Hulu and HBO Max, right? So, right now, Disney is uh, number four, right? And it's about to overtake Hulu and HBO Max. So, it'll be Netflix, Amazon, and then Disney Plus. And then within three years, Mm. Disney's to overtake Netflix as the number one streaming service. It now, makes sense. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, it just makes sense, though, because, you know, when Netflix first came out, we all ran there because that's where all of the movies online were getting to. So a lot of the movies that Disney, a lot, they had a lot of licenses with Disney movies, had a lot of licenses with, um, you know, The Matrix was on there. A bunch of these cool movies were on there up until... Disney realized, okay, we have to compete with Netflix and then just started yanking all of those movies out of there. I remember when Avengers was still on um, Netflix, when the whole MC universe was, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the MC universe was on Netflix, you know, that, that, that's how it started. And so we all moved into this. So now that the strategy of pulling content out of Netflix and putting them, the, putting them in their own streaming services evidently looks like it worked because now people are moving towards those streaming services. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, right? Netflix was profiting not only off of its own original content, but also on the content of a lot of other uh, networks and, and uh, what's it called? Uh, film studios that had licensed their product to them, right? And so, yeah, you were exactly right. As Paramount decided, hold on, give us back all our content. We're going to make our own little streaming service. As HBO decided, yoink, no Sopranos, yoink, no, none of that. You know what I mean? As as even, uh, you know, I was taking stuff like Rick and Morty and Family Guy from, you got the, the Office, right? Like you got a lot of stuff that people were drawn to as staple shows that are now going to their individual Netflix, right? Office is Peacock or whatever, the NBC. You know, yeah. one small corporation making up that that twenty eight percent. So I think we've identified two major reasons: that slow down in original content, looking kind of meh, and two, these other companies are pulling their content and bringing it to their own streaming services, left Netflix in a very vulnerable position. Now. Yeah, and what puts Netflix in a predicament right now is the fact that with things like Disney and with, um, let's say, Paramount, HBO, these large studios, they have a market 
they have uh, the ability to be able to drop these large, big budget movies and franchises on the big screen as well as in their so as well as on their platform. So the same way that, for instance, Godzilla uh, would be there only for two weeks or for a couple of weeks, and then head over to uh, the, the big theaters, they have the ability to be to play between those lines. Whereas, for instance, with Netflix, you you rarely it hasn't got to that point yet where this hype behind a Netflix movie being dropped on Netflix and in cinema at the same time. Well, actually, it did happen once, but it was during COVID. The Irishman, right? Oh, yes. On Netflix, but it's also like a three and a half hour long movie, which is a lot to ask to sit in the theater for. So that was an interesting choice on their part. But I think you identified something real important, which is scarcity, right? Yeah. Holding a blockbuster movie only on a streaming service for two weeks, not dropping your show as a bingeable, but as we saw WandaVision and now Falcon and the Winter Soldier, major Marvel properties uh, being dropped week to week. I don't know if you've been keeping up. I don't know if you watched any of those. WandaVision was kind of fire. And I did not expect to care about uh, neither of those characters very much. But uh, they did some cool retro stuff, which hook, line, and sink to me. And, you know what I'm nice. saying? I'm a sucker for nice. like that. But also, Falcon and the Winter Soldier is uh, kind of, was kind of met and is ramping up, like kind of in the middle. You know what I mean? So, like, as I'm a comic book nerd, if y'all can't tell, you know what I'm saying? I like that stuff. So I've been keeping up with that. And those properties are going to do real well for, yeah. for Disney's. The fact that it's projected to overtake Netflix in three years does not surprise me. Uh, and the last little data fact that I got for y'all, just to emphasize how much Disney is growing, right, is that Disney passed 100 million global subscribers within 16 months of launching. And that took Netflix 10 years. Damn. But then I don't think that's fair because Netflix is paying costs for first mover costs, right? First mover cost means that you're going to run in there, set up the table for somebody, and then somebody with bigger cash comes in and sits at that table and bears and eats all the fruits of it because they can afford a bigger chair. You know, and that's the reality of that's the reality of the market. And the question of anybody that is a first mover in any sort of market, um, you need to ask yourself, how do I protect myself from how do I protect myself from that cost? The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Come on now. Come yeah. on now. You know, but in Africa, we say that the second elephant, it finds the water during the first time. That is a much less by the statement. Y'all should work on that. I know I I'm gonna cut that out. I'm gonna cut that out. I just embarrassed. I embarrassed my entire family with that one. Apologies. Uh, you know, we gonna hit them with the heat. The heat proverbs. That's gonna be the actually heat proverbs is the name of the episode. Big facts. But yeah, man. So real quick, I think a, a nice way to little put a bow in this conversation. What do you think are the top three streaming services that you gotta have going forward, right? For for TV and movies, like what do you think? What are, what are, for the type of stuff that you are into, what are the streaming services you got to have? Um, top three streaming services has to be just off the top Netflix. But the, this is unfair, though, because I'm in Africa. In Africa, I don't get HBO Max. I don't get, um, I don't get Hulu. I don't get Disney Plus. Or if they do, then clearly I'm just not privy to it. But even then, when you do get them, yeah, I mean, like, you can get a VPN, like you just said. But then again how many people are open to going that route? There's still a lot of sketchiness behind VPNs and there's still a lot of mystery around the amount of prices that you should be paying for the VPN. So that's, that's kind of where we are. But like Africa, Netflix slaps, and we have our own stuff. Showmax, which kind of partners with HBO. So that's, 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 all, that's all I have my reference to right now. What about you? No, that's dope. That's dope. I think it's cool to hear, like, because, yeah, obviously, that 28% of those smaller services like Showmax make up a bigger share than the majority, right? So mm. I think it's dope to, like, hear what are the ones that people haven't even heard about. Maybe invest even a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Thinking ahead. For me, I got to have, um, yeah, I kind of I kind of take or leave Netflix to be, to be real. I like, I got to have HBO Max because there's a lot of shows on there that are background for me. Going to watch yeah. the phone the Sopranos, you know what I'm saying? Um, I gotta have 
Hulu because Snowfall, right? FX, got to have that. Rick and Morty is on there. So that just takes care of like the TV that I basically watch. And then third one, uh, this is not an ad, but I would just say that um, get Shutter, bro. Like if you like horror movies, get Shutter. It's like a really dope get Shutter. Like a, it's the if all of these Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, if all of those are kind of carbon copies of each other, just trying to put out like the big, mm. the big picture content. Uh, Shutter is a genre specific to horror, but that cares about the genre that's putting together nice. the content that that it cares about the art, right, through and through, the popular and the more niche stuff. So I just put them up there just because I like for art to be carefully curated. Come on now. You Come on I mean? now. Come on. Nah, man. And before we jump, can I go take a piss break, sir? Go ahead. Bless when I don't want it. Woo-wee. Rolling That's right nice. along with some of this carefully curated content that we have for the folks, Miles Xavier. We got some rather technical things to be able to get into, sir. Um, current news this week. Apparently, some of the big companies in America aren't paying their taxes, bro. What's up with that? It's messed up, fam. <laughs> less than nothing. What's less than nothing? How you pay less than nothing in taxes? I tell you. You get money back. You get money back. Now listen, I know I've been hitting y'all with the numbers today. I'm gonna keep going. I want y'all to bear with me, man. I got a little bit of information for y'all, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. 26. Sounds like you're about to read right there, bro. Hey man, I think I I was I think I I think I Yo nigga, your brother told us how you be all into reading this shit. Hey, that's some real good shit, my nigga, for real. Congratulations, nigga. I think I gotta get in my reading bag today, man. I don't usually do this, but I think I gotta get in my reading bag today because 26. 26. Mm. Major U.S. companies, including FedEx, Salesforce, and the y'all that are up in the corporate world, y'all might know Salesforce over here. Mm. But I know y'all know Nike. Nike, a pretty big company. I know Nike. I got some Nike stuff. Got a lot of Nike stuff. Yeah. Probably a billion dollar corporation. Definitely a billion dollar corporation. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me keep reading. <laughs> 26 major US companies were able to avoid paying any federal income tax for the last three years. Three. All three of them years. And pay no income tax. Top 26 major companies in the US, including FedEx and Nike, Salesforce, have avoided paying federal income tax for the past three years, although they reported a combined income of $77 billion. Interesting. Interesting. Since 2018, three years, right? They also received nearly $5 billion in rebates for an effective three-year tax rate of negative 6%. Negative. Come, in, come again? Say that number Say that number one more time? Uh, these companies combined for an effective three-year tax rate of negative 6%, which means they got money back from their taxes after making $77 billion. Yeah. Hmm. But it's not surprising, though. It's not surprising because at that echelon of business, that's at, at, at that echelon of business, politics collude with the business in order to make sure that the business is as profitable as it can be. When you're when you're dealing with that much weight of revenue and and of and of market share, you're you're able to allow the system to work for you. I mean, no better. This, we've seen examples of this throughout history. A very important point you make, my dude, because most of this, most of it is probably legal, right? And the reason why it's legal is because these major corporations and other major corporations, maybe some that aren't even on this list, but that are taking advantage of a lot of tax breaks and regulations that benefit major corporations, 
have made enough money to continue to lobby for the type of legislation that benefits them. A lot of that legislation was either uh, unearthed, re reapplied, or, or, or instituted during uh, the presidency of, of Donald Trump. And it's resulted in very favorable tax opportunities, uh, some related to COVID, that have caused a lot of these companies to pay nothing in taxes. And when I just get down to it, man, the thing that the thing that really hits me wrong about it is that when you talk about numbers like seventy-seven billion dollars, whatever percentage of tax revenue you want to take off that helps a lot of people. Here. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. And that's just, I mean, that's just, that's just it, right? It's one of those things where I could, I could keep going. There's a lot of information about this, about this topic, um, about the CARES Act, how that act passed last year to help businesses and families survive the epidemic of COVID, temporarily, temporarily allow businesses to use 2020 law, law talk it, 2020 losses to offset profits. See, y'all, I just had to let y'all know why that was so hard for me to say, you know. They was able to use 2020 losses to offset profits and years. So when you can do that, man, when you can say oh, all the taxes we have deferred, let's cancel some of those out because we lost money compared to what we were projected to do mm. during COVID. What you're just seeing is the loopholes that allow the game to run the way it does. The loopholes yeah. slant the pyramid so that it's too steep for a lot of small businesses, especially individuals, to climb up while a few people sit at the top, make the money and the rules. Yeah, and I mean, this this type of loopholeage is so <laughs> loopholeage. <laughs> there you go. I'm just so proud. Yeah. Right. That is that is their daily title, loopholeage. But there's so much loopholeage that happens up in these upper tier echelons of businesses. Um, I mean, even in the energy space, you have such certain certain situations where, say, for instance, the ooh, I feel bless you. Sneeze. A sneeze coming along. The pollen is killing me. Excuse me. But anyways. Shout out to all the people with allergies, man. We with y'all. I hope I don't have a, a sneeze, a sneeze fit again. Those be, those be tough. You ever had a sneeze fit in traffic? <laughs> almost almost killed myself one time sneezing so hard. <laughs> uh, but as you were saying, as you were saying. Yep. And it's gone. And it's gone. But anyways, um, you see it. You see it also in, for instance, the energy space, right? Where you have um, these green certificates. And so, for instance, let's say an energy company is quite green, or it's done a lot of green initiative things. They earn a green certificate, and this green certificate then allows them to be able to, or let's call it better yet, an emission certificate. And then these emission certificates are essentially you get a certain amount of quota of emissions that you're allowed to produce given the certificate that you have. And then let's say, for instance, a company that produces less emissions, they uh, then have more of these emission certificates because their impact is quite little. And so they can be able to then squeeze that up. And then you have these bigger companies who do pollute a lot that have smaller uh, emission, uh, emission certificates because then that you know, they can only emit to a certain extent. And then you find out that these guys are purchasing these certificates from surrounding, from these other companies and companies are then hoarding them together in order to be able to increase the amount of pollution that they can do. It's, it's, it's like that all, all over the place. And then the, rea like, the reality of capitalism, right? Not to, not to become revolutionaries in the way that we're talking. Join us. <laughs> Join us. Every time a black dude starts talking fast and, and about capitalism, I just feel like I'm Dr. Umar Johnson and I don't want to be that. That's okay. I'm actually, I mean, I don't know even how much Dr. Umar really rails against, against capitalism. He just rails against whiteness. Boy, man. I, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different discussion. Uh, shout out to Cornell West, man. They fucked up for not doing what they need to at hard before you, bro. That's the type of intellectual you need to lift up. Shout out to Cornell West, but um, indeed, indeed. but that's that's what I was saying about is that in capitalism, it's unfortunately geared that the politics of it and the rules and the regulations and all of that apply most to the people at the bottom, and then they only become subjective 
and malleable and loose the higher you get up with that food chain. And that's just the reality of this pyramid scheme that we call an economy. So can we depend on capitalists at the top of that capitalism to be generous enough to advocate for legislation against their own interests? Not one or two of them, but the majority of them. I believe, I believe where we are now is just that a lot of the capital, a lot of people that are benefiting from capitalism and are becoming the richest people are people that are trying to solve solutions. We saw Elon Musk become the world's richest, uh, for moments, the world's richest man last year, um, or not the world's richest. I, I, I think he either became the world's richest man or top three, something to that effect, a milestone nonetheless. And this is somebody whose whole company is based on um, who most of his company is based on solving legitimate social solutions, you know, whether it be energy efficiency or things of that nature, that's what the aim for that is. So I think over time, we're going to see an increased amount of people who do have access into these large amounts of capital and do eventually become the elites that have a greater social, uh, are, are more socially conscious and have, you know, direct a lot more of that capital to, to impact. We'll get you. We'll get you one day to over to the side of. We won't wait for there to be enough woke billionaires. We'll just educate the people until we can work ourselves to a position where the people have power. Yeah. We'll get you there. We'll get you there. We'll get you there. We'll get you because that's the whole point of it, right? It's just if it's it's realizing that you have to first invest into the future that's coming. So you spend the time invest in the youth and then you set up opportunities for them to be greater than yourself that's the whole mo of being of empowerment really yeah but i think there's something to be said for now i a lot of us don't feel like waiting for waiting to be given for that to be given back to us by those who have achieved it is a reasonable thing to, to expect because it hasn't happened I, I think I don't think we've ever seen in mass the whatever whatever type of person reaches the top of society give that power away intentionally back to the people the lower but what class would that society. look like what what would that look like in practice not paying zero dollars in taxes not getting money back from taxes, right? A tax rate on corporations that takes a reasonable amount of that money across all corporations to put back into infrastructure and to improve the quality of life of the people, right? Not only in taxes, but also in business practices in terms of energy and sustaining the planet, but not only making what corporations are held accountable to, what uh, catches attention in the news, it should be like, we, th we shouldn't, this, how long has this been going on, bro? Three years? Mm -hmm. And this is not a huge story even that I'm seeing. It's like something that I came across to talk about for the podcast. Like that, that's not the type of, that type of system, no matter what type of person gets into it, is going to have every incentive not to give that power back away. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that we'll ever see those corporations decide what they lobby for based on their billions of dollars to be based on the people, right? What we do see is pressure. We see corporations now, we see the MLB has moved its, uh, its uh, major game. It's, I think it's the MLB championship from Atlanta after what they were doing as far as voter suppression. I think we can see pressure, but I think, I think a lot of us are reluctant to rely on that shift of companies and corporations becoming woke enough and the people that run them still having that power and deciding to give it back to the people. I think a lot of people want that power to be redistributed amongst the people and they can make the decisions about how about the society themselves. Right? But yeah. And that's and that's the and honestly that's the utopian um that's the utopian dream that we have of being able to empower people, which is that thing such as all the all the judicial responsibilities and and things that relate to let's say um, 
social funding and things of that nature is that that power gets given into the people. There's no reason why, um, you know, we shouldn't be able to one vote on our phones and also be able to dictate where our taxes go to. Um, you know, you should be able to dictate, especially if it's a, a, a let's say a municipal tax or it's a provision of a provision pro 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 tax. <laughs> you did it. I did it. I did it. But even if it's that, you get to vote on it. In Africa, that has a higher level of relevance because we're dealing with corruption. And so over here, being able to get a system like that, where you kind of almost take away the power of the people in authority and the people that have previously had the power to dictate where the cash is going because they take it to their pockets and you bring that to the people. Now the people can then get to decide what the cash has to be able to do. We then become the custodians as opposed to the people in power who have consistently siphoned it, squandered it, and now put us in quite the financial predicament. And I think the, the difficult part of that struggle is living in, in taking advantage of opportunities in the world as it is mm. while advocating and trying to, to lean into the world that you want to see, right? You have to be both realistic and revolutionary at the same damn time. And we bring you that. We bring you that. We bring you that. Now, if we're stepping into conversations, Miles Xavier, that are um, difficult by nature, um, it means we are going into our recommended and review section of today. Yeah. 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 Listen, dude, I'll, I'll come out and say it. I'm tired of all of these, um, all of these sexual abuse documentaries and stories. I, I think I might've hit my quota. Um, Ellen versus Farrell is the quota. Congratulations. I'm done. No more. I think we've seen this quote ahead for a few things. Slave movies. Yes. At that point. Like, oh, okay. I'm done. I'm done right. slave movies. Conspiracy theory documentaries. Don't fuck with cats. Great. Loved it. Q and I won. I think my brain, it, my cup won it over with conspiracy. And now, yeah. category number three. Um, but I think it's just an important conversation to be had, even if you're sick of seeing these stories, even if you, you feel like you've reached your limit as far as subjecting yourself to the details of uh, sexually explicit crime regarding minors. I think we've, what we've seen in, in that, what that documentary shows is that silence is not the answer, right? We need to have conversations about one, <laughs> first of all, that make, it clear that no amount of power, no amount of influence should allow anybody to do anything, to subject anybody to any type of victimization. Uh, and what is it about us that allows our, us to turn a blind eye from that? And how can we protect ourselves and the people we care about from being taken advantage of and not feeling like they can share what's happening to them? Um, so there's a lot here, gross but important. Uh, you wanna give them just a little bit of like, general background of the story of what this is about. I mean, Woody Allen's a nasty dude. Um, he, they, 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 the documentary goes into his obsessive nature over his first, ch over his child. Um, he does end up marrying and might still be married to, I believe his um, adopted daughter. The question that I have, Miles Xavier, and you can stop me here if I'm wrong and off. However, what, other race adopts mass numbers of other raced kids. And I'm not being Dr. Umar Johnson about it. However, it was hard not to see a fetish element to the number of children this white lady was adopting. And you see that, and you've seen this happen plenty of times. Now I'm not saying it's the wrong thing because after, as someone that's just been helping an orphanage this weekend, those kids need as much love as they can be. And I'm a proponent and supporter of anybody who brings them their love. However, I do think it is particularly interesting um, and worth unpacking how 
one particular race of people tend to exercise that type of adoption than other races. You've never seen a black mom adopt seven white babies, keeping them in <laughs> seven white babies, keeping them in Bronzeville. <laughs> That's never happened, dude. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That that would be a new one. That would be a new one. I, I guess from my perspective, I would be interested to find out how much of that overlap the specific group certainly seems to be white people, but also how much does that overlap with people of celebrity and of extreme need, right? I mean, I don't know what's in the mind of these people, and I would hope that when you're adopting a child, you do so with the sincerest of attention, intention, no matter who you are. But Pete, like, I think a lot of these people, as far as celebrities, are under a lot of pressure to not only appear like they're aesthetic beautifully and, and always have it together, but also that they're giving back, also that they're beautiful, wonderful, amazing people, right? And so uh, not saying that everything is black and white, but I think a part of what might attract a celebrity, right? Like uh, Miss Farrow, or I mean, we've seen Angelina Jolie get into this bag, right? Is like, it's a, the optic, it's a it's a it's a aw optic, right? It's like oh look what she did for that that little brown baby, right? You know, I, I can only imagine, you know, what it was like back in the village that I'm sure that he came from. I think they know that. that. I'm sure that he came from. <laughs> I think the I think part of it is if you see me with a child that <laughs> this child is obviously adopted. Everybody who sees me with this child is gonna know that this kid is adopted because one, it doesn't look like me and you know, me and my partner. And I think that there is something that people like about that and appreciate about that. Yeah. If they're giving the child a, a happy home and opportunities they wouldn't have access to and not abusing them and mistreating them, uh, I think it's tough to raise a child of any other race but your own in a way that respects their culture. But I'm not saying that any of those people are not doing that. Um, yeah. Clearly, it's around and 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 them was doing, was not doing that. Not healthy, not acceptable, not a home. I wouldn't want any child I've ever known to no. be alone. Yeah. No. 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 Not at all. Not at all. I mean, I think the, the thing that really stood out to me is in the first episode, and I only watched, I watched one episode, and I was like, oh, okay, one episode, I'm going to do this one episode a week or something, you know? Um, and one thing that stood out to me is that he went to counseling for inappropriate affection for his daughter. He went to counseling for that. It's, it's so bizarre. Bizarre, but that's the part that I would encourage. I would encourage, yeah, if, and for anybody having those type of feelings or anybody who you suspect is interacting with kids in a way that's inappropriate to seek help right before yeah. anything actually happens um i think a big big takeaway from this is like you got to be careful like who you allow to care for your children right and just because somebody might feel like a good friend to you or a good person to you how they interact with kids might be totally totally different um so in the in a point that can't be lost upon this is that he's a powerful man with money he made a movie and art an art that people love and so oftentimes we look at people that are in that position as if they can do no wrong or will cast some inexplicable doubt upon any accusation because we feel like i want to continue to enjoy what this person has given to the world i don't i, I don't want to ignore it right as much as adopting a whole bunch of kids might be a racial thing we know due to r kelly that touching a whole bunch of kids right isn't a racial yeah. thing so it's a whole it's a, a whole thing about like you can't give don't give anybody the benefit of the doubt with how they treat your kids especially if that kid is expressing or you have a feeling like there's something going on that's wrong there um and if you're a witness to that you have to speak up you have to say something to somebody you know what i mean uh you have to, to involved you gotta protect kids protect women man just like, no matter who's doing it, right? Uh, we, we, I think we don't gave him a lot this episode, but there's also a conversation we had about how kids at the border are being treated under the Biden administration versus the Trump administration and holding government officials accountable 
no matter who they are, to treat people humanely, right? And uh, yeah. cover that equally and fairly. And so I think the overall message is just like, <laughs> be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. And, yeah. and are caring for children if you are, uh, if you have children that you love and love you that are around you, listen to them. Listen, 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 listen to children, listen to women, listen to people. Yeah. Um, and do something. Act. Act. We can help each other. You can make a difference in somebody's life, bro. Listen not just mentally and, and try and we gotta start giving each other the time of day for real. We gotta change the yeah. meaning. Really give each other the time of day. Like I'll stop my day if you if you really say if when I say what's up, how you doing, you really say nom nom, not good. Mm. That should that should stop my day. That's what giving somebody the time of day should really mean, bro. Like uh that's it. That's all I got. No, nah, I feel you. I feel you and that's real. I feel, I feel you and that's real. And it, it is important to say, because a lot of people are carrying these types of dark things with them, you know, and, uh, you know, we recently now in South Africa heard a story of this young 22 year old girl who jumped off of a building in Cape Town. And, you know, she was, uh, you know, well, she was a popular young lady, you know, suicide. Uh, you know, you, people are walking around with very, very dark, dark, dark things, you know, so. I like what you're saying about, um, you know, being, being very empathetic to people and uh, giving time to people, opening up yourself to people. Um, and as always, man, we just hope that the show is just even just a, a, a teaspoon of, of happiness and an injection of positivity into uh, people's week. And that's what, that's what we're here for, man. And that's what we bring. Big facts. Major facts. Yeah. That's what we bring them. That's what we bring them. I don't. I don't know what else is on the agenda. We didn't ran through the whole list. We 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 creeping good onto onto an hour. Yeah, I think we done gave them a lot, man. It's always a pleasure to be in this space. Yes, sir. Of, you know what I'm saying? I'm always bringing you know a whole bunch of stuff, disorganized, disorganized thoughts to the space. I always feel like I leave you know with a with a cleaner slate, with a with a good vibe. Uh, but I, but I, I am grateful because because I know we know we know we know we know that y'all have way too many choices when it comes to a podcast. Y'all could be anywhere in the world listening to anything that y'all rocking with us. We appreciate that mm. for real. I think we're getting pretty good at this thing. I think this is episode thirty, and I am humbly happy. To say that I think we did a hell of a job. Uh, there's nowhere to go but up, baby. So if you are here, if you are in tune, you are shooting in the gym with the guys. You are shooting in the gym with a celebration of love, a celebration of celebrating, a celebration of how good it feels to be black. It's gonna feel this way. Favorite thing in the world, baby. Right. And listen, like that, we hope you eat something delicious, hug somebody you love, we appreciate you. Peace water like that we go yes sir